Hello, welcome back to the workshop. Today I'm going to be making a little sculpture influenced by nature. So it is going to be of some bulrushes, or I would actually call these cattails. I don't know what the real name for them is, but bulrushes or cattails, I think they're the same thing. They're sort of like a, a marshland plant. It's a bit like uh, a reed almost, and then it has this big head on the top and with these sort of grass-like uh, leaves. Anyway, I've got this sculpture to make. So I'm gonna have a go at making one today. I've never made one before. There's a bit of forge welding in how I'm gonna make it, uh, but hopefully it's all gonna go to plan. If it doesn't, I might end up making another one anyway, because this is, this is a sculpture for a client. So we'll see how well it goes today. If it doesn't go too well, I'll end up making another one, but hopefully it's gonna be all right. There's gonna be sort of three components to the actual sculpture. There's gonna be a central stem with the head and then two leaves coming off one either side. For the head, I'm going to be using 16 millimeter round bar for the start. And then we're going to cut this off this bar and weld on an eight millimeter round bar stem because obviously the head is quite chunky. And then I don't really want to be forging 16 millimeter round bar down to eight mil. So I can just do a, a nice forge weld to get a stem on there. And then we've got a forge weld the two leaves on as well. So I've got to forge out the head first and it sort of it has a step down at the end down to about six mil round and another step down at the other side of the head down to uh, sort of eight or ten mil round which is where it's then going to be a scarf welded onto our eight mil stem bar. But we've got to work on the end first and so we've got to be thinking about forging a taper on the end of the bar, quite a severe taper, so a set down, without forging fish lips. So fish lips are where the ends of the bar sort of collapse and go over each other. And this often happens when you're working on the very end of the bar and creating either a steep taper or like we're doing a steep uh, sort of isolation. One way to prevent that is to have hard hammer blows so that we're really penetrating into the steel. We've got to remember to really move the steel so we're not just forging the outer sort of casing. You've got to think of steel as that. So it's got an outer casing and an inner core. We've got to get down to the inner core to really move the steel and prevent fish lips. But because we're forging on the end of the bar, if we only forge a little bit of material, it's just going to collapse every time because there's no sort of structural integrity in the steel if we're only, say, taking 10 mil worth of material, which in the grand scheme of things would be enough material, but because it's only 10 mil of a 16 millimeter round bar, it's just gonna collapse every time you try and forge a set down. To prevent that, you have to take at least the width of the material. So we, when we're setting down our first little step down on the near edge of the anvil, we've gotta take at least 16 millimeters of material preferably more than that to be safe so that we don't don't collapse the end and just create fish lips. Anyway, I've got the piece in the fire. It's already hot, as you've seen, so we can take it out now and begin to forge on the end of the bar. I'm rotating constantly so I get a nice round transition down to the bar. Unfortunately, that didn't work quite as well as I thought it was going to. I'm gonna to have to come on here with the hammer and carefully clean up around that edge so we get a nice round transition going down into this, this stem of material. I'm also going to cut the end off as it's way too long at the moment, but that's always going to happen because of the fact that I have to take at least 16 mil of material here. We're always going to end up with a longer piece than I actually wanted, but I can always just cut it back after rather than what would have happened is taking the correct amount, so say 10 mil of material, all that we would have done is collapse the end causing uh, fish lips, cold shuts, and we couldn't use the piece.
Now the end's forged out, I'm gonna texture the section of 16 millimeter bar, which is gonna stay solid, and then go to the back and forge the second isolation down to the stem. Now that this is off that bar, I can forge a scarf on the end of this little nub of material and then a scarf on an eight mil round bar and then forge weld the two together. There's gonna be a lot of forge welding today. This is the first weld. It's just a, a simple scarf weld. You notice that I didn't upset the stem bar or the handable length as I'm gonna forge a taper on this bar anyway so there's no need to upset the end really because it's gonna get forged down thinner than eight mil. You only really upset a weld if you want it to be the, if you want the final dimension to be what the bar is already, if you know what I mean. So if I wanted the stem to be eight mil round bar, I should have upset the end before forging the scarf so that I've got the material there for the actual weld. So I'll get these two pieces hot in the fire to a forge welding temperature, bring them out, rest this one on the far edge like that. So the actual scarf is up off the anvil so it doesn't cool down too fast. Then get our handable length set it down like that, hold it there, drop your tongs, get it set. A scarf weld is a hard weld really, you know, they are, they are quite hard to do to actually get everything in the right place before you lose your forge welding heat. I'll talk about how I get to a forge welding heat, what it looks like, how I weld in a little bit more depth later on, on a different forge weld, on a, I've got a fold over forge weld to do, so I can talk a, a little bit more in depth at the forge so you can see me actually heating the bar up to the, the welding heat then. This one, I'm just gonna concentrate on actually getting it right. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully we can actually weld these two pieces together rather than me just blabbering on about getting a forge welding heat. I picked the wrong day to do forge welding. I am absolutely dripping in sweat. But anyway, we've got it welded on. There's no evidence here of the seams of the weld. So it, it looks like it's a solid weld and hopefully it's gonna be strong enough. I mean, this is only a sculpture anyway, so it doesn't need to be really strong, but it's nice, it's on this stem. So what I can do now is flip it around, forge a leaf out on this end, uh, fold it in the middle, then do a second forge weld at that fold, then we're gonna to have to do the second leaf out of a separate bar and weld that on after. I am gonna come back at some point and clean up this transition point here, as it's a bit sort of gradual, whereas this one is nice and sharp and nice and steep. This one's a bit more gradual. So I will come in, clean that up with some files or grinders or whatever it needs to, to look right. Uh, but for now, we can flip it over and get working on the first leaf. I'll start by forging a taper on the end of the bar, which we can then flatten to give us the profile of this leaf. Now, 
Now that I've got the profile sorted on the leaf, I want to give it a bit of a 3D aspect to it rather than it just being completely flat. So to do that, I'm gonna come in the step of the anvil and just use the cross peen, sort of force it in there, giving it a slight cup. I could do this on like the swage block or in a, a hardy tool, a swage hardy tool, but I think, you know, it's, it's just gonna be just as easy to do it in the step of the anvil. So I'll just do it in there nice and quickly, give it a slight cup. Now we've made the leaf 3D with a bit of a cup, I want to add some shape to it rather than it just being straight. Then make a mark in the middle of this bar, cut it, fold it over and forge weld the two together. I don't want to cut all the way through, I just want to nick it so it'll fold where I've made that cut. I'll clean the inside so that we've got a nice surface for welding. Now I'll bend this over. So now we're ready for welding. So it's time for the forge weld. I just want to talk a little bit more in depth about forge welding as I don't think I've really done this before on any of my videos. So when you're going to do a forge weld, obviously the, the main thing is the heat. So you, you've got to get your heat right. And the sort of temperature that you're looking for is just under the temperature at which the steel starts to spark. So a good tell is to get the steel sparking and then go and actually forge weld, but there you're over oxidizing the steel, you're actually burning the steel then, it's not, it's too hot for a welding temperature, the welding temperature is just under, and so it is really hard to judge when it is just under sparking. A good tell is the steel starts to, the surface goes sort of, uh, it's get, it gets a sheen on it. it, it almost looks like there's a liquid on the, on the surface of the steel, presumably because it is slightly molten at this point. Um, but it also, it then starts to bubble and that's your temperature. And you've got to be careful not to get it too hot. If you get it too hot, it'll over oxidize, you'll burn it and you'll actually be losing material. So you'll lose material. The fire will literally just eat at the steel and you'll burn it off. So the way that I like to do it is to get my steel in the fire, have the fan on just ticking over nicely. You don't want a big fire, you want a, a reasonable size fire to get the heat up, but you don't want a huge fire so you're getting all of it to a forge welding heat as you don't want that. You only want the area that you're going to weld at a forge welding heat. So we gradually bring the heat up and then just before we think it's starting to get to a welding heat, turn the fan off. And what we do there is turning the fan off means that the fire is gonna stay hot as it's only just got up to temperature so it can hold the heat. And it means that we're not, we're, there's gonna be less of a risk of us burning the steel off because the fan is off, so the fire's not gonna be getting any hotter. But it also means that we can let this sit in the fire, really soak all the way through so we get a good welding heat on the area that we want to weld rather than just like a flash welding heat. So. You can, you can get sort of like a flash welding heat, and what I mean by that is just a heat by sticking it in the fire, heating it up really fast till it sparks and then go, but that's not always the best thing. I feel for myself is get it in the fire, bring it up slowly, turn the fan off, let it soak and get up to a welding heat, then weld it. By shutting the fan off, it also means that there's not gonna be any more excess oxygen in the fire, so the steel can't oxidize as much as it would do if the fan was on. Obviously oxidation is a bad thing because that's then forming scale or iron oxide which can inhibit the weld. Another thing, keep your fire nice and clean. If your fire has clinker in, that can also inhibit the weld to the same as the scale. It can get in the way into your seams and it's just not going to weld. When you're actually forge welding and you see sparks fly out, that's all the impurities. So like 
plink earth and scale, that's all of that being shoved out of the, the welding surfaces. So that, that has to go somewhere, so it sprays out the way, which is why usually when you do forge welding, you should really wear an apron. One final thing is to make sure that the distance from the forge to the anvil is nice and short. That way we can uh, decrease the time that the workpiece is in the air, and so cooling down in the air, so we're less likely to lose our welding heat. I realise I haven't mentioned anything about flux, and that's because I don't really use any. I don't have any at the moment, or at least I don't have any good stuff. The stuff I do have is just not very good flux, and I find that it actually inhibits the weld, whereas when I weld without flux, it seems to work a lot better. So I'm just not going to use any flux. So I'll get this in the fire and go through the process of forge welding the end. I've now turned the fan off. I'm just going to have a look. You can see there's a couple of sparks coming out, so I would say that I'm pretty much at a welding heat now. So just some nice easy blows there, nothing too hard. Give it a quick clean with a wire brush, get it back in the fire. Turning the fan off and just letting it sit there. We've got that weld good and set now. I'll just take one more heat to make sure that it is nice and strong. So that's pretty much it. I'm not really working the seams in as I want the seams to to fade away, I just want it to be welded, but having those seams sort of fade away I think is going to be a nice, uh, more aesthetically pleasing way of doing this rather than actually trying to weld the seams together. So I'm looking at the surface of the steel and it's beginning to bubble. So we're nearly at the heat. My plan now is to make another leaf which comes sort of there, so I've got to make that and then we can forge weld it on. I've realised I've bent this leaf in the wrong way so I'm going to have to unbend it and bend it going the other way as I want it going on this side but obviously that way round and so the cup is on the wrong side so I'm going to have to unbend it bend it around and then we can weld it on. We've got our two pieces now ready for welding. The traditional way to do this is to wrap it in some wire so that they're held together whilst we get a welding heat and weld them together. Then you can just take the wire off afterwards. got these together now nice and tight we can put this in the fire and now weld these together I've just used a stick welder to weld this collar on, so it's not the most traditional way of doing it, but yeah, I think that's the, a neat way of doing this, so you can't see any weld from the front there. It looks nice and neat, and that is so that we can screw this to the wall, as that's, that's all that this is going to be, just a, a wall sculpture, but it needs a way to fix it, attach it to the wall, so that's what I've come up with. I didn't film it because it's it wasn't really the most interesting thing ever, so there you are, I've done that. I've got to finish it now. To finish it, I'm just going to do a nice hot oil finish. Nothing nothing fancy, just to 
seal it and give it a bit of a darker look. So I've just been carefully warming it up in the fire and I've got an oily rag. That is a little bit too hot. So you can see there I'm brushing it on and it's sort of steaming quite vigorously and then the sheen from the oil is then evaporating off. So it's too hot at the moment. You've just got to let it cool down a little bit. And then you can begin to brush the oil on, burning it onto the surface, creating this nice finish. The oil I'm using is just vegetable oil. Literally nothing fancy, just vegetable oil. You sort of want to keep on wiping your steel, brushing away the excess oil as it's still smoking. You sort of, you want to do it until it stops smoking really. That'll give you the best finish, or at least in my experience, that's the best way to get a nice finish on it. Here's the finished piece. Hopefully you can see it well enough. I've really enjoyed baking this. It's been a much more traditional approach to blacksmithing. You know, the, the, most of the techniques that I've used today, you would have been using 200, 500, 800 years ago to make something very similar to this. I personally am a much more modern blacksmith, so there are things that I've done today that I wouldn't usually do. For example, the wire wrap on the bottom here, I wouldn't usually do that. I'd just tack it with a stick welder and then go and forge weld it. You know, it's it's much more secure to, to actually just get a tack on there with a bit of weld rather than faffing around and wire wrapping it. I've actually been meaning to make a cattail sculpture for quite a while as I've I've always seen other blacksmiths do it. I think it's quite a common thing that people people make and I've always wanted to have a go at doing it. So this is again, given me the drive to explore my own curiosity in blacksmithing and, and make something that I think is actually rather a nice, nice little piece. Anyway, in some other news, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to do a video for a little while, probably a couple of weeks as the start of July is looking very busy for me. I've got a, a craft fair coming up next weekend uh, Friday to Sunday so I'm not going to get any time to do any filming then and then the week after that it's the Yorkshire show so I'm there from Tuesday to Friday so again I'm not going to get any time to do any filming during the week then so there's going to be a little bit of a break before I can do another video but hopefully after all of these craft fairs and shows I can then get back to making some more videos. I look forward to seeing you then, or rather you seeing me, I always get that wrong, but hopefully you'll enjoy those videos and I hope that you have enjoyed this one. Bye.